We're at the 2018 Ripcord reunion, talking now with John Tamburini of Hillsboro, New Jersey. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, John, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, and uh, uh, What year? 1948. Okay. And moved to a town of Millstone. In Somerset County, I resided in Millstone until my time of um, being drafted okay. into the Army. Uh, and, and back up a little bit, what was your family doing for a living when you were a kid? Uh, my mother was a homemaker, my father was a construction worker, and um, that was really it until the time I went into the service. Okay. Did you finish high school? Pardon? Did you graduate from high school? Yes, I did. And what year did you graduate? In 1966. Okay. And so what did you do after graduating? I went to a technical institute and it was a two-year program and during my two-year program I would continue to go to the draft hall to find out where my number was and when my number was getting closer and I started my second year I really didn't concentrate on my studies and was asked to leave. Mm. I went out and bought a new car and shortly after that I got my draft notice, was drafted into the army and uh, gave the car to my brother, my younger brother, and uh, was in the Army in uh, February of 1969. Okay. Did um, you get the car back when you came back? No, my brother kept it. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, where did you go for basic training? Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay. Uh, and describe what basic training was like at that point. Basic training was really, um, it's funny because I trained with, uh, in Fort Dix in the winter of uh, February or March, which um, was kind of sort of different, knowing that I was going to be going to Vietnam probably. And we did force marches through quite a few feet of snow and did our grenade qualifications and our rifle qualifications um, in the snow, laying in the snow. And um, then I um, left Fort Dix after my basic training, went home for a week, and then went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Okay. Now, when you were at Fort Dix, uh, how much emphasis was there on discipline and following orders? Uh, quite a bit. It was quite a different change from uh, civilian life going in there. And I thought that um, I was brought up in a pretty good household. And I had some, I wouldn't say strict parents, but we were organized and uh, not maybe regimented, but we had certain rules to follow. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, I just thought I was a pretty good kid at that point until I got into the service and I saw a different side of life and it was like, um, you're going to get your ass kicked. <laughs> and it kind of sort of straightened you out. It makes you uh, a little bit more a man. All right. Uh, now, did you understand at the time what they were doing? Uh, not really. No, I just knew that I was serving time and that I had to follow orders mm -hmm. and um, it was the military. And I knew I wanted to be a good soldier because I wasn't about to disappoint my family mm -hmm. and be discharged. And I was continuing to follow orders. And again, I had the attitude to make the best of it. Okay. Now, um, the other guys that you were training with there, uh, did they take the same attitude or did some of them have trouble? I think they pretty much did. We pretty, we pretty much stuck together as a group. And we knew that we were all in the same boat together, mm -hmm. if I could say that. Um, and I guess we were all a little concerned what was down the road for us, knowing that Vietnam was going, Vietnam was active, and uh, you didn't really know what MOS you were going to really get. And basic training was really just basic. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. How much did you know about Vietnam at that time? Really nothing. I mean, other than maybe I shouldn't say nothing. On Sunday night, I remember laying in the living room, and we used to watch the honor roll. And we used to watch who was killed in action. And I never really thought much outside the box other than, wow, you know, mm -hmm. somebody, a lot of people are getting killed in Vietnam. Never thinking that I would fit, set foot on that soil. Okay. All right, because you're saying, you, you use the term MOS, which is your military occupation specialty. Yeah, it's so, a um, military, yeah, occupation yeah. to service, yes. Yeah, yeah, so you, you don't know where you're going to go, what you're going to do. No. All right, okay. And so then, uh, but you're now sent, and then they send you for advanced training in Fort Sill? Yes. Okay. And what kind of training did you get there? We not only got basic training, but we also learned 
about the uh, howitzers. We trained on the 105s, the 155s, the tanks, and uh, other handguns like grenade launchers, rifles, which was an M14. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did field maneuvers, and uh, that went on, you know, for another couple months. Okay, so you're getting, in addition to the artillery training, which would be standard there, they're also giving you some infantry training? Yes, they also came hand in hand with that, yes. Okay, because the understanding is you might well wind up in Vietnam and... You needed both yeah, to survive. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, and did they treat you any differently at Fort Sill than they did back at Fort Dix? I think Fort Sill, Oklahoma was a little bit more rigid because I think they were trying to fine-tune you, if I could say that, mm -hmm. for that career or for that MOS. Um, and it was really a much more serious and concentrated, um, what can I say, job, mm -hmm. that you had a responsibility. And there was a lot more to learn, especially, you know, learning all the artillery components mm -hmm. and, you know, all about them. And like I said, with the tanks, the 105s, the 155s, um, and there are the other um, handheld devices, grenade mm -hmm. launchers, rifles, and even grenade thrown. Okay. Uh, now, um, did they tell you anything at that point about Vietnam? Yes, they did. As we got to the end of um, your advanced training, um, they basically brought you aside and said, listen, you have a very good chance of going to Vietnam as basically a private E2, which I think is what it would mean, rank. Yeah or you can go to the NCO Academy, which you then is a six-month academy. You come out of Sergeant E-5, but that you were going to go to Vietnam, mm -hmm. no questions asked, and you will serve time in Vietnam. So what I did at that time, I contacted my family and my, who is my wife today, my fiance then, and I said to myself, I think I want to go to Vietnam as a better soldier instead of going as an E-2. Mm -hmm. I said, I think it's better. And if there's a bonus to it, you made more money, which was hardly anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I then went home on leave for a short period of time, went back to Fort Sill, and uh, I did a six-month academy, which really fine-tuned me that much more beyond any expectations that I had. Um, it was quite rigorous, um, very involved, and it was, it was another eye-opener, and I thought that I was going to go to Vietnam as a good soldier. And if it wasn't for that, I don't think I would have come home um, alive. Okay. What kinds of things were they teaching you then, the NCO school? Well, it was more, more artillery, but also a lot of advanced life-saving um, in, in respect to learning how to fight, um, and also POW MIA training, which was um, quite an eye-opener. and. Um, that was something I never thought I would experience, but it did. And I, again, the whole program made me a better soldier. Okay. And did they have a leadership component to it? Oh, yes, it did. Yeah, you, um, you had a platoon, and every time you, you rotated who was in charge of the platoon, um, and if you messed up, uh, they, let, they let you know about it. And um, I did mess up one time when I left the whole battery, if I could say that, at attention for quite a while, and um, I paid for the, uh, how could I say it, I paid uh, the price for it. <laughs> because, and then I had to put my head in the bush and talk to the bush for a while. <laughs> but, but again, that was all part of the, uh, I think the mental, and not only you know, the physical, but the mental, you know, to see at what point you're gonna take it. Now, I know that with the infantry NCO school, one of the things that happened was after you did the training part, they sent you to work with a basic training unit or an AIT unit where you were one of the sergeants doing the training. Now, did they do that for artillery, or was your six months all just training you? No, we also had, we also had to be responsible for the other troops that are going into training in okay. AIT okay. or in the advanced training. Right. Yeah. That was part of it. Okay. So you did some of your sergeant stuff with them. Yes. I was an acting sergeant when I was in, um, even, I was an acting sergeant even in AIT, even in the advanced infantry training mm -hmm. after Fort Sill. Okay. Or even after Fort Dix. Right. Okay. So you've been doing some of that all along and now you do some more of it. Right. Okay. I, I kind of sort of, I look back at it now and when we first, um, 
went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, I don't know how it happened, but I was designated as a as a sergeant, and I they give you a temporary sergeant patch to wear. And it was at first uncomfortable, but I said, you know, it's all part of learning about the leadership and the responsibility. Okay. So basically, your, your approach is you're going to do there, you're going to go, you will do the best job you can, and you want to prepare yourself to do that as best you can. That was correct, yeah. Okay. And I wanted to go as a good soldier. All right. Okay. Now, when you complete the NCO Academy, do you get orders for Vietnam? It was automatic. Okay. Yes. All right. Because that was part of the condition that when you signed those papers for the Academy, mm -hmm. that you were going to Vietnam. Okay. Uh, did you get to go home before you left? Yes, for one week. Okay. Now, what was that like? You're going back home, you're not, you're out of the military for a week, and now you know you're going to Vietnam. Pretty tough. Okay. Because you've got, now was, were you engaged to be married at that point, or just had a girlfriend at that point? Or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and how did your family view that? Had your dad been in the military in World War II, or yeah, okay, all right, so not easy, okay, all right. Uh, so now, um, how do they get you to Vietnam? Uh, we flew from um, Newark Airport to, um, I believe, an air base in Washington State. Okay, so yeah, traps yeah. or yeah, and then that's when you got changed. Mm -hmm. And then from there we went to, um, I think, Yokota Air Force Base in Japan. Okay. And then um, from Yokota Air Force Base to Cameron Bay. Okay. Uh, what's your first impression of Vietnam? The smell. When they opened the door, I thought I'd put my head in somebody's dirty underwear. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. I don't know. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of decaying vegetation and any number of other things making smells, but yes. yeah, that's a pretty common impression. All right. What did they do with you at Cameron Bay? They uh, put you in a hooch for a couple hours and then they arranged transportation for you in a, um, in a Chinook and then took you to um, Camp Evans, which okay. was up north. Now, did they take you? I mean, Cameron Bay is a long way from Camp Evans. Did they maybe fly you to Camp Eagle? I remember Eagle going in a, in, a, in a helicopter. Okay, but a was it a long helicopter ride? Not that I remember. No, okay. it didn't. Yeah. Didn't. It well, didn't really stick in my mind. It was long. It's possible that they flew you in a military transport to Da Nang or to Fubai or someplace, but maybe but, Fubai. But I do remember landing. But, but you got you. But you know, you went to Camp Evans in a trip. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes, I did go to Camp Evans. All right. Uh, and um, how do they deal with the new arrivals then when you get there? Well, I guess it was reality that this is real. You're in South Vietnam now. You're having your exposure to the environment. And the first night I was there, I had to pull guard duty. And uh, that was a little nerve wracking. And uh, I could swear that uh, some of the trees grew feet when you're working, when you're on guard duty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did they. At this point, did you know what unit you were joining, or? I believe, yeah, I was with the 101st at that point. Yeah. And then, obviously, I was with the 2nd of the 319th Artillery. Um, and um, we stayed at Camp Evans, and then it was that following morning that we took me to my first fire base, which was Fire Base Jack. Okay. So, now, the 101st sometimes did an orientation for the new arrivals the Screaming Eagles replacement training, the CERTS training. Uh, did you not do that? I don't remember that. Well, if, if the next day you went to your unit, then you didn't. Right. Okay, all right. But you're an artillerist, so that might be different than it would be for the infantry guys. It might be. But okay. we, they sent me right to a, um, an artillery base. Right, okay. Uh, so Firebase Jack. Now, describe what that base was like. What kind of country was it in, and what did it look like? It was in a lower land, you know, lower lying land, um, and um, it was a very well, I guess, fortified, if that's the right name, fire base. It was somewhat established by the time I got there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was a very well arranged fire base. And um, 
I went and that was really my first assignment to go there. And then that's when I met, you know, my commanding officer. Okay, and talk a little bit about him. He, the commanding officer, um, was an E7, and um, he basically gave me a gun and responsibility. And uh, I had a crew that was already there, obviously, and they were in country a while. And they taught me some things, and we got to learn each other's uh, ways and everything. Okay. So and you said commanding officer. You basically meant the uh, battery's top sergeant? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. So he assigns you yeah. to a gun crew. You join the gun crew. Uh, how did the guys in the gun crew that you joined treat you? Uh, very well. We got along quite well, very easily. You know, we got along because, um, you know, I, I just wanted to be a part of their team. And here they were already in country, and I respected their knowledge of what they had. Okay. And we got to work together. All right. Now, how many men were in that gun crew when you joined it? I believe on my initial howitzer section, I had five. Okay. Myself and four others. All right. Now, when you were back at, at Fort Sill, what was the official size of a howitzer crew supposed to be? Typically four or five. Okay. okay. So, yeah. so, you, so you were full strength? Yeah, probably yes. Yeah, you had your gunner, your assistant gunner, and then you had a couple guys that would hump ammo. So you got four and then five. Yeah, typically five. Okay. I guess, because sometimes gun crews would be under strength when they're in the field. Yep. All right. But at this point, you, you, you're full we, up. We had, a, we had a good crew. Okay. All right. And then how quickly do you start? Um, were you firing the piece right away, or is it quiet at Jack for a while? We had fire missions every day and every night. Okay. Um, you know, firing on enemy positions. Um, there was always activity. Okay. Uh, and so now, what, what month was this that you made it to Vietnam? I believe it was February. Okay. February, I believe I went this time. Yeah, I'd have, I'd have, yeah, it was February that I went into, into mm -hmm. country, yes. All right. Okay. And then how long did you stay at Jack that first time, do you think? I believe we stayed at Jack about a month and a half, maybe. Okay. Two months. And then uh, we went to Firebase Gladiator. We fired onto that location to secure that hill. Mm -hmm. And then we moved from Firebase Jack to Firebase Gladiator. Okay. Uh, now, how was the Gladiator different from Jack? Jack was basically a low lying firebase at the foothills, mm -hmm. whereas Gladiator was really just a mountaintop um, with a severe grade on each side. And um, that's where we joined up with the 155 howitzers. On the, we were on the top section of Gladiator with the 105s. And the 155 are down lower. But again, Gladiator was a very tight fire base with very little room to move. Okay, I guess you have pictures of it. And it looks basically like a fairly well, kind of a long, narrow hilltop with only a limited amount of flat space to put yes. gun positions on. Yes. All right. Uh, and what kind of protection did you have? As far as... Either other troops or physical defenses. No, we had ourselves and just the troops that we had on Firebase Jack, and that, that was really it. And then, you know, the 155s. Okay. But was there an infantry unit that was guarding it at that point? or Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. No, it was just us. Okay. So did you have to do... Did you have perimeter... Did you have guard duty as well as... Yes, and guns? that's one thing we did. Yeah, I did guard duty every night. <clears throat> And that's um, one thing that I did do is I let the guys sleep as long as they could. And we typically had a fire mission like 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning on suspected enemy locations. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then it went right into the normal work day, if you want to call it that, or the normal routine. All right. Now, you would come in as, as a sergeant. Are you taking over a gun crew right away or quickly? Yes. I okay. took one over right away. Okay. So you come in. You're sort of the new guy. Okay, so you come in, you're the new guy, you're giving orders to these other guys, but they've all been there already. That's right. What kind of relationship, to, how did you approach that? It was, I think it was, a very, it was a very smooth transition, and we got along, and I don't remember anything whatsoever where we had any conflict, any differences or anything, and we, we just meshed together. Okay. And I never really, regardless of the fact that I went over as a sergeant, I didn't put myself above them. Okay. I, I knew I had more responsibility as a sergeant, but I didn't put myself above them because we were all in the same situation, if I could say that, or same, we were there for the same common mission. Okay. 
Uh, did you find that there were things about just ways of doing things there that were different from what you were trained to do? Yes, definitely. It, it's a, it's um, yeah. Some of the things were training was one thing, and you learned a lot of the basics and the procedures. Mm -hmm. But when you went there, your procedures changed, and your your routine changed as far as like doing a fire mission mm -hmm. or what you did because there was no way that they could ever. I don't think there was no way that they could ever create that condition mm -hmm. to a hundred percent stateside. You know, just for what you're dealing with, the way the battery is set up, the entire battery. Okay, uh, and I don't know. Were there physical conditions or environmental things that uh, made it harder to maintain the guns, or? Well, because you know you had the high humidity, and the uh, and the rain. Um, but also, yeah, I think that was really you know the humidity, the rain, the heat. You know, that affected you. Mm -hmm. um, Again, a different routine. You're dealing with a total battery now of six guns versus training on one. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's different procedures. You know, you can learn everything. We learned a lot stateside, but but when you go into a complete full war type of zone, mm -hmm. it was different. Okay. All right. Uh, and while you were on Gladiator. Uh, did you have that, that first time? Did you did you have any um, North Vietnamese trying to probe the perimeter, or did you get attacked at all? No, we did not. On, not on Gladiator, okay. but we were very very close to the jungle itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, we were right there. I mean, right on the edge. But we were fortunate. So you didn't get mortar attacks or anything not like that. that. Nothing. Not okay. that I remember. Okay. All right. Uh, now, while you're out there. Do you have any real sense of what's going on any place else? Not really, because at that point we, because of the guns and, and the firepower we had, I created a sense of security, if I could say that, mm -hmm. and that we were like um, invincible. You know, here we have all the big guns, we're invincible, we have the rifles, we have everything, and we could kick anybody's ass. Um, and you just created a, you had a, you created a sense of security mm -hmm. within yourself and you felt comfortable with the guys that you were with. And we had good leadership. And yeah. uh, now, who was your battery commander at this point? Captain Rich. Okay, and, and tell me a little bit about him. Captain Rich was a, um, he came from the 1st Cavalry Division and um, quite a wiry guy very active but very supportive and very involved with the troops mm -hmm. um, and uh, he was out there with you in the thick and the thin of it um, and I had a lot of respect for him and um, he was just added to the whole group you know and um, he just kept everybody going okay now when a uh, when a fire mission get, gets called what gets ordered um, what sort of your procedure, what do you do if you say, okay, we have a fire mission, now what happens? Well, I was primarily a gunner, mm -hmm. and a gunner will set the azimuth of the gun, and then you have an assistant gunner who will set the elevation of the gun, and then you have a guy that's going to be loading the breech, and he's going to be responsible for cutting the um, bags of ammo because you have different charges. You have a charge of one through nine, and you also have different type of um, uh, different types of heads that you put on the artillery shells, um, whether it's a time delay fuse or whatever, um, and that's what you get those commands. And then it was my responsibility to be the to be the uh, the gunner that all these commands were followed, mm -hmm. and those commands came down from FDC. So it's fire direction control. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So they're giving you specific. They're giving you coordinates and settings, and they're giving you azimuth, mm -hmm. which is the direction of the gun. Uh, they're giving you elevation, which is the height of the gun. Mm -hmm. They're giving you charge, which is the distance that your artillery shell will go. Right. Okay. Uh, and then, um, how rapidly could you fire that gun? It all depended upon your forward observer, how he wanted to fire it, because you would do like a, let's say a, um, a location round, mm -hmm. and then he would he would adjust that whether he would walk it in or walk it out or make it go to the left or make it go to the right for the, you know, for the enemy positions. 
Okay. But will there be points when the idea was to simply fire as many shells as possible at a particular target? I think that's when you, when you had a good enemy target mm -hmm. and you were yeah. on the enemy, yeah. then it would be like all hell breaks loose. Yeah. <laughs> then you just fire as fast as you can. And at that point, I mean, how many rounds per minute do you think you could get off? Hard to say because you got to hump them, you got to cut the bags of ammo, mm -hmm. you got to load them. Probably I, quite a few. I mean, per minute, it's hard. That, that was, I can't remember. Yeah, that's fine. But I mean, we would. We would do it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, okay. So you're now you're you're on Gladiator for one. At this point, the the fire base at Ripcord is, is getting established, and there's operations going on around it. Uh, and then, um, is that your next stop? Yes, it was. Okay. How do they get you from Gladiator to Ripcord? With a uh, helicopter, with a crane. It was called a crane, like mm -hmm. a helicopter, where the, the howitzer was hung in the middle. And that's how we got transported. That's how we got transported from Jack to Gladiator. Okay. So they have sort of the Sky Crane helicopters that'll carry the artillery pieces, and then you ride in other helicopters? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we, have, we ride the Hueys. Okay. Now, when you got to Ripcord, were there uh, positions already established for your guns that they got dropped in, or did you have to build them? We had to build them. Okay. We had to build all the, um, we had to build the entire base. Okay. For the art, for the artillery pieces. All right. So what did that involve? Quite a bit. Um, as far as like establishing an ammo bunker again, establishing a perimeter. Um, the ammo was the most important thing. The ammo got protected first before you protected yourself, mm -hmm. and which was kind of sort of, okay, why are we doing that? But <laughs> that was part of the procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, once you got your ammo protected, then. You could build on protecting yourself or your, per, you know, your people that are with you, and then that's how really Firebase Ripcord grew because we kept growing. You know, because of the amount of ammunition, we had to make our ammo bunkers much larger. And now this was a, a pretty basically you're on top of a small mountain there. It's a big big piece of rock. Did you have engineers helping you blast out holes, or were you doing all of this yourself? No, this is weird. we really when we landed the gun there it was really less like um like a rocky, sandy soil type of thing. Okay. And that's where, you know, once when they put your gun in, that was it. You didn't do anything. Okay. You just build around it? No. Your gun just sat there. The only thing you built around it was your ammo bunkers. Okay. But was there no kind of protection for the gun crew, or were you totally exposed? The gun was totally exposed. Okay. Yeah, we had no protection to the gun. Just the ammo. The ammo was more important. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, and then, did you have create sleeping holes or bunkers or anything like that? The sleeping holes were on the side of the hill, okay. and you crawled into a culvert, um, which was a makeshift shelter, mm -hmm. and that's how you slept. Or you slept on top of the ammo, which is more protected, which I've done. Okay. So you're inside the ammo bunkers. So there's something above you. There were sandbags. Yeah. yeah. So you had some type of product, you know, some type of protection. Okay. Uh, when did you arrive on Ripcord? Do you think? I believe it was May, late later on in May. Okay. All right. And at that point, you know, the, you, there are infantry units kind of patrolling around the area and looking for enemy and occasionally finding them, uh, but the fighting hadn't gotten really intense yet. But did you still have a lot of fire missions? Yes, we did. We did, and we had a. Um, Again, being a sergeant, and uh, every night we had our meeting about what was going on as far as like enemy activity mm -hmm. or basically what we're looking for within the next couple of days. Um, but we did have a lot of fire missions. Mm -hmm. we, fired, we fired every day, hundreds of rounds every day mm -hmm. on potential sites. Okay. Uh, now, um, before the beginning of July, um, and just when the sort of siege starts or whatever, uh, was it pretty quiet in the sense that you weren't getting shot at, or were there mortar rounds or rockets that would ever come in? No, again, it was really, I kind of sort of became complacent, mm -hmm. if that's the right word, because here we went from Firebase Jack to Gladiator to Ripcord, and I thought that we, excuse my French, but I thought we could kick anybody's ass. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were, we were powerful. You know, and uh, we could do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and every night, because I was a sergeant, 
uh, I had to go to a briefing every night, and um, they would tell you what the you know what kind of activity was going on, what what to mm -hmm. look for. And nothing really was really, you know, jumping out of you until the end of June. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then right about at July 1st, uh, you, the base starts to take mortar rounds. Uh, yeah, we had a meeting the last day in June. Mm -hmm. And they said that there's a lot of enemy activity in the area and that we should be expecting some type of activity within the next day or so. Mm -hmm. And I went back and I told my guys what's going on. And I said, you know, there's, there's going to be some activity. And um, the first round came in about, I guess, 6.30, 7 o'clock on July 1st. And then I realized that this is war. Um, this is real. Okay. Uh, now, did the, how, how close, did, so the, were they using mostly mortars at this point? Was it mortar rounds coming in or were there rockets or? It was hard to say whether they were mortars or shells, you know, mm -hmm. like an artillery shell. Yeah. Um, because there was just so much of it. You really couldn't investigate the hole, I right. guess you could say, because, I mean, it was, I mean, it was blowing, it was blowing stuff everywhere. Okay. Now, you said the, your, your gun was basically in an exposed position. Uh, yeah. did, did, it, did the position take any hits or did they always miss you? No, it didn't. <laughs> Up until about July 6th or July 7th, it missed me. And then that's when an incoming round came in and um, it blew me back. And um, it happened so fast that when I, when I woke up, um, Captain Rich was standing over me. And he says, are you okay? And I says, I don't know what happened because I, I blanked out. Mm -hmm. And he says, you got to get up. You got to get back to your gun. You got to get back on the gun. And I says, that it, and I was still dazed because I got... I got hit with an incoming round, and and I went back and I went back to the gun and, and continued fighting, not realizing that I was hit. Um, and then that's why, I, well, I got awarded the Purple Heart, but I didn't realize it at that time. Mm -hmm. So you hit with shrapnel or rocks yeah, or something? Shrapnel, yeah. Okay, but not enough to actually slow you down or. Not enough to, no. It was, it was. I had the ability to go back and keep going. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then did you had did a medic check you out later or figure out if you were hit anywhere or yeah they did I was hit you know mostly in my um in my arms and my hands and stuff um and there was like you know this the bleeding obviously mm -hmm. and but I went back and and continued you know with your with the gun okay now on the night of uh, July 1st uh, between first or very early morning on the second uh, one of the line companies Charlie company got hit on hill 902 which was nearby uh, now, do you remember anything about that night, or was that no. not something your battery would... You, you might have been too close even to support 902. Yeah, I don't remember that. Okay. Because, um, again, it seems like you're, you're, you almost had, like, tunnel vision mm -hmm. because you were focused on your gun and your, and your battery and what you, you were trying to protect the perimeter mm -hmm. and do your own fire missions. That's, I mean, um, I didn't really... I didn't realize, you know, the other activity on the other hills, except mm -hmm. for ripcord. Okay. All right. You just you just point the gun where they tell you to point it and, and fire and just, right. just do that. Uh, and uh, now, were there occasions when you could actually sort of look out or, or see uh, tracer fire or, or, or shells landing in other places or airstrikes? I mean, would you ever be a spectator to the battle or were you always just at the gun? I was always at the gun because we... You had to stay at the gun because because the amount of firing that you did, mm -hmm. and you either had to make sure that you had enough artillery shells. You were humping mm -hmm. artillery all day, mm -hmm. and you were firing all day, and you were even firing at night. Again, we started fire missions like two o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and we would fire for a couple hours, and then come daybreak, I would get the guys up, you know, because there was only two of us at night that fired, and the other guys would be sleeping. Were there occasions when you'd have everybody up at night if there was a you had to support a unit in the field or I don't really remember having everybody up at night just myself and another fella okay all right uh, now we I guess what was but I guess before the uh, the sort of the scene before July what was sort of daily life like on the hilltop you you were either preparing artillery shells 
you know, for your next fire mission, or you were filling sandbags, um, and just really your normal activity. I and mean, that's what our, that's what your day consisted of. Okay. You know, pumping artillery shells, getting them out of the boxes, uh, taking care of the howitzer, uh, and again, just doing your fire missions. There wasn't a day that you didn't have several fire missions or. Okay. What did you do for food? <laughs> so sea rations and whatever package you can get from home, mm -hmm. and then if you were lucky, you got a hot meal. Um, Would they deliver a hot meal to the fire base occasionally? Or yes, yes, they did. Yeah, fire base Jack was more of um, you got more hot meals, I guess you could say, out of a canteen or out of a cooler. Yeah, than you did at Gla uh, Gladiator or Ripcord. Right. Because of its proximity to the camp. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and so now, once the, once the siege gets going, then um, it was you. You couldn't really move around. You wouldn't leave the gun position very much at all. We, but well, we obviously. We, I think if I follow you correctly, our guns stayed in the same location. Yeah, yeah, the gun, right? yeah. But but our fire missions were on any type of enemy location mm -hmm. that was called in. Um, and it got to the point where we were actually using the howitzer as a rifle and we were sighting down the gun tube mm -hmm. on we could actually see to to I guess it would be the south of us where the enemy was actually running around mm -hmm. and they were running around the hills and we would direct fire on them and they were just like ants mm -hmm. they would come out of one hole go back in another hole um, and that just went on every day okay uh, now, your battery doesn't uh, has a major crisis during the course of that siege. Uh, can you talk about that? What happens to you? Is, as far as the when it came time to the end? Well, there's the uh, helicopter crash. That that was the Chinook that was bringing in the the ammo in a sling, mm -hmm. and he would always drop it off in front of my gun. And um, I would always go down, and he would unhook it, and I would talk to the guy laying in the belly of the Chinook. And um, well, he would always, you know, say something to me, or you know, we, would, you know, just talk to each other for a second or two, mm -hmm. and then he would take off. Well, that one particular day, I think it was later on in July, yeah. that um, the Chinook came in. I was down there. He unloaded the ammo let the sling go and the Chinook was starting to take off and got about 40 feet above the ammo bunker and it took on fire on a tailpiece and I could see the flames coming out of the tailpiece of the Chinook and I could see it starting to struggle and the blades you could just see it struggling and it wasn't getting altitude and then all of a sudden the ship came down and the guy that was in the in the belly of the Chinook fell out and the ship landed on him and pinned his leg to the top of the ammo bunker and I went down there and I talked to him and he wanted me to cut his leg off because he couldn't get out and I said I can't cut your leg off I'm not a medic and when I says I'll go get a medic and when I went to go get the medic which was around the side of the base and I came back the whole ship was engulfed in flames, and that was it. I, I, I couldn't do anything. But that's that's what happened. Okay. And, and now you've got a burning helicopter on top of an ammo bunker, and a load of ammo right there. So now, what happens? It was the beginning of the end. Um, the beginning of the end is that we knew that at this point that we had to abandon whatever we could or well, do whatever we could do and it got to the point where Captain Rich then said uh, we have to um, he called my gun out and he says you gotta put an incinerator grenade down your gun tube so I popped the incinerator grenade and I put it down the gun tube and it melted the breech block together so that they couldn't use it against us mm -hmm. and then that was really a lot of the beginning that was the beginning of the end. But was the ammunition now blowing off? I mean, was it... Well, oh, we had the fire, yeah. The ship yeah. was on top of the ammo bunker. Yeah. Because that blows up. Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, and and then basically that now 
Did that damage your gun already, or was the gun not affected by the blast? Or oh yeah, well the gun wasn't damaged by the blast. The gun was damaged by Captain Rich telling yeah. me to put the incinerator grenade down the tube. Okay, so the expectation was that I guess at this point, why were you doing? I guess I'm not sure I understood, but why you'd be destroying the gun if the gun itself hadn't been damaged yet, and you still hold the hilltop? Well, because we were being. I think at that point, I think we knew that. If I, we had really, I, I think there was just, just a lot of chaos. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there was, at that point, the organization maybe fell apart, if I could okay. say that. Um, and we just knew that there wasn't much more we could do because the ammo bunkers started to go up. Yeah. Uh, and if the ammo bunkers blow up, then wouldn't that That's, damage the guns or? It would, it would. It was right in front of the gun. Yeah, okay. And so this is before the ammo bunker blows up, you actually already damaged, destroyed the gun? If I remember that, yes. Okay. All right. And do you think that was happening at the other gun positions at the same time? or? Well, Captain Rich was with my gun. Okay. And he stayed right with my gun until the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when the ammo starts to cook off, do you get out of there and, and find a place to take cover? Or? Yeah, we, we had to basically just fend ourselves the best we could. And then... I think that was probably around the 19th of July. Yeah, I think the 18th is the date of the crash, helicopter crash. Yeah, the yeah, 19th. And, and the base gets abandoned on like the 23rd. So, yeah. uh, is it, and because your artillery battery, what gets hit, affected that way, that had a lot to do with it. But okay, so now that now that that's happened and your battery's not there, what happens to you? I leave, because okay. you know, because again, we're starting to, we've lost all. I don't want to say sense of. Um, how can I put it, like, like chain of command? Mm -hmm. um, it was quite chaotic. And, and basically it was like, a, uh, you gotta run for your own life. And then people, you know, people were just going wherever they could to find shelter. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I, that's when I knew that we were being overrun. And I knew that I had to get, uh, I had to get away from the gun. Mm -hmm. And I had to get to another safer location. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I had lost everything that I had. And I low crawled from where my gun position was to the other side of the base towards the Ashore Valley side. Mm -hmm. And I went over the side of a hill and I found an opening. And when I looked in the opening, I saw a set of eyes in the back of the opening. And I figured this is it. This is, this is gonna be my grave. Um, and I said, at that point, I had nothing left in me anyhow because we were taking on tear gas and I was throwing up. I couldn't throw up anymore. Um, and then um, I went and I found this hole and in the back of this hole, there was these two eyes. And I went, yo, GI? And he goes, GI. And I went in there and I stayed in there for a while. I believe it was until the next morning. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know who he was. I don't know his name. I know he was a GI, um, and it was just we we're just being overrun at this point. Just it was complete chaos. Okay, but there's not enemies storming up the hill. You're just no, there's running. Just, there's just confusion on top of the hill. There was confusion, but there was also still incoming coming yes. in. Yeah, and you know basically there was no there was no organization mm -hmm. at that point. Okay, uh, so you're there overnight, uh, and then in the morning, do you go? look out to see what's happening or does someone well, come find you? Well, I realized that, that come morning, I realized that everybody's being taken off the base on the other side of the, on the of rip cord. Mm -hmm. And I knew I had to get over there to get, to get taken off of there. Right. Um, and so what I did was, when I thought that it was clear enough for me to get over there, I low crawled to the other side of the fire base and then got on a chopper mm -hmm. and I was taken back to Camp Evans. All right. Uh... And then did you find, was the rest of the battery kind of already there, or...? We kind of sort of put everybody together. Um, I know I, I met Captain Rich. Um, I guess we met some of the other, I don't remember how many of the other guys were there at that point. But we kind of sort of put our group back together, if I could say mm -hmm. that. Got a, um, got a new um, set of orders or a new sense of direction. Mm -hmm. um, Stayed, I think we stayed at Camp Evans one day, and then the next day we went down to Firebase Bastogne. Okay. 
Now, were there guns there for you to use, or did you? They have to fly in new guns, or they flew new guns in for us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, Captain Rich at some point gets hit. Uh, was that the end of Ripcord, or was that? Captain Rich got hit on Ripcord. He didn't get hit on Bastogne. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So he went back to. He was back on Ripcord. Um, because I think he was wounded pretty badly. He was wounded, um, supposedly, he was wounded several times. Okay. Um, some of the stories that I've read about him, he was wounded five times. But I do know that on, on Firebase Ripcord, I know that he was hit a couple of times, maybe mm -hmm. three times. Okay. But you remember him being back at Evans when you came back? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All we, right. were, we were all there. All right. Now, and then did he join you at Bastogne, or was he hit on Ripcord and then gone, or...? Pardon? Was, did he go, did he join you at Bastogne, or was he wounded badly enough that he didn't come back? No, he, he was, he was, he stayed active. Okay. Captain Rich stayed active as well. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah. He stayed active as well with me, or with the group, mm -hmm. with the platoon, and, um, like I said, we met back at Camp Evans. Right. Okay, but they, you didn't really get any time to, you didn't really get any time off there. No. No, <laughs> it's immediately mm -hmm. off, off to Bastogne. I got time off for maybe a half a day, okay. maybe a day, and then we were back out to Bastogne. All right. Uh, now, what was Bastogne like? Not, not, not so much on the hilltop. Mm -hmm. um, if I remember correctly, we weren't there very long. It was kind of sort of like a... I wanted to say like a mild terrain, but it was it wasn't like Ripcord or or um, Gladiator. Mm -hmm. It was a more low lying type of area, not not a severe hilltop, mm -hmm. but it was elevated. Okay, uh, and was it a well established base? The part we had, no, no, we had established that base. Okay. All right, and did you get regular fire missions from there? Yes, we did. Uh, and then about how long do you think you stayed there? I think we stayed there about a month, month and a half. Okay. And do you recall if that base ever got either attacked or probed while you were there? No, we didn't. No. Okay. All right. Uh, now, by the time you, now, when you're at Bastogne, uh, was the monsoon starting yet, or would that come later? I think it might have started then. Because you've, I... got, you've got pictures of a howitzer in the mud. I th yeah, that might be a bare stone, mm -hmm. um, or that's early parts of Jack going back to Firebase Jack. Okay. Where we went back to Firebase Jack again. Okay. And then is Jack where you spent the last part of your tour? Yes, that's where it was. Okay. Now, once you get back to Jack, is it any quieter than it had been before? Or do you still have the same number of fire missions? Yeah, we did. We did have, um, but. We did have the fire missions, but not as intense as um, Gladiator and Ripcord. Mm -hmm. Not, not as many, but we did have them. Okay. And do you think more of them might have been harassment, interdiction, or rather more routine kinds of fires as opposed to defending a unit or something? I'm sorry. But well, do you think? Well, there are different kinds of fire missions, and some of them are simply checking ranges or firing harassment interdiction? I think all were enemy locations because okay. all the fire missions we did were, were enemy locations okay. that were called in. All right. Yeah. I don't think we ever did any, like, um, maybe if you want to call them harassment, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I never really thought of it that way okay. or heard of it, but we always did fire missions that were called in from the... Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's probably the kind of thing that the fire direction control people know about. Right. You know, it's this kind, this kind, but they're just telling you, go fire X number of rounds at this place. Yeah, because all our directions came from yeah. the fire direction center. All right. Now, um, did you get um, any time off? Did you get any R&R &R or anything like that? When I initially went there, I wanted to go to, um, um, I forget the name of the place. Anyhow, I had two choices, Hawaii or someplace else. Mm -hmm. And I didn't choose Hawaii, and I didn't choose, and I, choose the other, I chose the other place. And as I got more involved, um, I felt more of a responsibility to the men. And I passed up on the R&R &R completely, and I mm -hmm. said to myself, I think if I ever get a taste of civilian life after being here, I don't think I would have went back. Mm -hmm. I would have went back probably, yeah. but it would have been very difficult. 
Okay, so you did, but but you did get uh, a, a, at least one bit of recreation in, because you went to a Bob Hope show, right? Yeah, one day. Okay, and so uh, was that around Christmas time or? Yeah, it was the Bob Hope show. Or, I mean, I guess it had to be. Yeah, I didn't. Everything is a your, your time element is a blur. Okay, you know there is no. That's one thing I thought of. There's no Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. There's mm -hmm. no. You don't stop on Sunday because it's a day of worship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you, there's, it's one thing that I that I gotta say, there was no there was no days. You didn't know whether it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Thursday, Tuesday. Mm -hmm. All you knew is the sun came up and the sun went down. All right. So where was the Bob Hope show? Camp Eagle. Okay. So who? Yeah. All right. Um, and what do you remember about that? I could hardly see anybody <laughs> because I was so far back. <laughs> I I knew he was up there, and I forget who he was with. The, you know, he was with another singer. Mm -hmm. Could you hear anything at least, or uh, could I see? Could you? Could you? Or could you hear anything? Uh, no, no. Oh. Because your ears are, your ears are ringing because of all the artillery fighting that you're doing. Like even right now, my ears are ringing. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's why I, you know, I have a bad hearing loss. All right. Okay, but it was a, a day doing something different from normal. Yes. Yes, it was. Yeah. All right. Uh, and now, when you got toward the end of your tour, um, were you keeping a short timer's calendar or...? Yes, I was. Um, and I did have it marked off. My, my fiancé, or who's my wife today, has sent me one. And I was marking it off. And I guess I got down to maybe the last two weeks or three weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd marked down the days. And then all of a sudden I had a, a nice notice that I can go home early. Okay. So I left Firebase Jack and went back, had my re-up speech, which I didn't take. They were going to give me another stripe, which mm -hmm. I didn't take. Um, I would have been an E6, probably making $370 a month instead of $315. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I wanted to go home. All right. So what's the process for getting you home? From Firebase Jack yep. to Camp Evans, okay. Camp Evans to Cameron Bay, mm -hmm. Cameron Bay um, on a jet to Fort Lewis, Fort Lewis with a change of clothes and your uniform and... Okay. What was it like flying out of Vietnam? They put you on a plane, you've got pictures, so what, 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 what was going on? Uh, or when you first first get of all, I think disbelief mm -hmm. that it was over. Because um, you said when you got on the plane, the lights were out. There were no lights on. It was complete darkness. Um, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. They paraded you, more or less, down this walkway onto this plane. You sat in a plane that was completely dark. No lights, no nothing, nothing. And the next thing you know, the plane is taken off and it's taxiing down the runway. Again, no lights, no nothing, no blinker lights on a plane. And we get to, I guess, to a, some kind of elevation. And then all of a sudden the lights come on and it's party time. And you're going home. All right. And, and what, was there a party in effect? Were people quiet or how did they no, I behave? Think, I think everybody was really happy. Mm -hmm. Well, they were. But um, you think about you think about who left who you left behind. I'm sorry. It's okay. Let me just yeah, let me, so can I call him back? Yeah. Let me call you back. I'm in an interview. Right. Sorry about that. That's all right. It happens. Um, no, I should have shut it off before yeah, we started. Yeah, but I should remind well, you. So, okay, anyway. Anyhow. So, 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 so you're, you're there, you're just on the plane, and you're just starting to think about whatever. You're, you know, I, I think it's almost like you're in shock. It's over, it's behind you. Um, it's over, it's behind you. You, you, you have um, second thoughts of, of what you left behind. Was it hard to leave the men from your crew? What's that? Was it hard to leave uh, your men behind you? Yeah, it was. 
because you, you you were you were really a family. You were you you had a common you had a common bond. Mm -hmm. You know, even though <clears throat> you know different there are differences and everything, you had a common bond, and uh, you developed a, a friendship. But you had a good working relationship. Again, like I was, you know, being a sergeant and stuff. Yeah, but I I, I felt like I was one of the guys. I didn't I didn't you know push around my rank. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the way Vietnam worked, people would go and they would stay for a year, and so over the course of your year, you would have gone from being the new guy to the old guy, and the men in your crew would have been all ones who came in after you did. Right. Okay. Now, did your crew take any casualties, or did you lose anybody? Uh, for other than just rotating out. Um, well, we lost the one sergeant on e, an E seven on ripcord. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, he was um, he was a lifer. Um, that one sticks in my mind the most. Okay. There might have been other casualties that again. But not um, from your crew. No, no. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So basically, that's a situation where, you know. By the time you lived, you knew everybody, and they all knew you, and, and you were that kind of group. You, yeah, you constantly. The the thing that you know that I remember is that when I went over there, I, I had a group or a group, you know, a crew of guys. Excuse me. And then in that group, obviously, some of them were there already seven months, eight months. Some of them they were there two months, and they would rotate out. Mm -hmm. And then it also seemed like you know when when we did one move to another move, you know. They would change. They would maybe go to a different battery section, okay. or they would go to a different howitzer section. Mm -hmm. But Captain Rich always tried to keep every howitzer section manned properly. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I can only say that I can only remember really having, I think, one or two guys with me the longest period of time, which was maybe six months, mm -hmm. because there was always a rotation. Right. It's not that you went in with a group and stayed with that group yeah. for that whole tour. And when new guys came in, how did you treat them? The new guys? Yep. Oh, well, I think I tried to keep everybody as an equal, mm -hmm. but I also tried to stress to them that, you know, it, it's war. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and not to go backwards here, but to go back to Firebase Ripcord, because we had so many casualties, somehow they shipped in three guys from the, from the back, from Camp Evans, that had no experience, and they were in the gun, sh the gun crew behind me, the gun pit behind me, mm -hmm. and we had an incoming round come in, and that incoming round went off, and, and I said to the guys, I said, don't go looking for souvenirs. And I said, there's another shell behind it. And they didn't listen to me, and wouldn't you know that there's another artillery shell coming in behind it, and killed all three of them. Mm -hmm. It, it virtually took their faces off. It killed all three of them like in a split second, and and I and I can still picture that to this mm -hmm. day. And I said, "Don't go looking, don't go looking for souvenirs." Mm -hmm. But that was, I mean, that was the faces of what we were up against. Yeah. Okay. So now um, you fly back to the states. Now, um, is your enlistment basically up at this point? Do they let you out of the army when you get back to the states? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes, they gave me my papers at uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when you um, went home, did you encounter any protesters any place, or did you hear about them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my own my own cousin. You know, and uh, I guess he had different thoughts, and got to the point where I kind of sort of had a fight with him, if I could say that. <laughs> so. But, but on the trip back, like when you're no. at the airports or things like that, you didn't see anybody? No. Uh, did you fly home in uniform or did you change clothes? Yeah, I flew home in uniform. Okay. Because yeah. sometimes people had problems and sometimes they didn't. Yeah. So, but you were fine. Okay. Uh, and now, once you get back home, what do you do? Kind of sort of go into uh, a cocoon. Um, I didn't sleep in bed for probably maybe a, maybe about five weeks, mm -hmm. six weeks. I slept on the floor. Um, didn't go back to work. Basically, just just hung out. I couldn't sleep in a bed because I didn't feel comfortable. I needed something hard to sleep on. So, um, and then I kind of sort of went back to work part time and. 
got back into routine a little bit more. Okay. And what kind of work were you doing? Back then I was doing um, engineering and surveying. But, yeah. Okay. Is that what you had trained for when you uh, were in college or is it just something you, did you learn it somewhere? No, I went, after high school I went into what they called a building construction technology yeah. course, yeah. which we talked about. Yeah. Um, but when I was there, I, I was working part-time at an engineering firm. Okay. And, um, and then when I got back, I went back to work for that engineering firm. All right. And did you stay with them or move around? or? I stayed with them. And then I um, felt that I wanted to do something different. I wanted to be outside more for some reason. And um, then I went to another engineering firm who put me outside because I... I wanted to be outside. I didn't want to be in an office. And um, then I went there and um, thought that I had enough of that. Um, I quit that. I basically stopped working for a while. And then I went to pump gas at a Hess gas station. And then um, some guy came in and offered me a job to do carpentry work. I took that and I kept that in my career. Okay, now this tape is about up, so we're going to pause here. And okay, we were talking about your, uh, your return home. Um, how long a time span was it before you wound up doing the carpentry work? I mean, how many years do you think were involved in there? Probably about um, three to four years. Okay, now along the way, did you get married? Yes, I did. I got married um, six months after I was after I came back. Okay. Um, and was your, did your wife think that you were in some ways a different person from the, the guy who left or did she ever notice changes or? I think so. Um, I, that's something you probably have to ask her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I think, I know she saw a different person. You know, I, I came back with, um, a different outlook on life. Um, and um, I know it was a different outlook on life. Mm -hmm. And I was obviously, you know, I, I respected her a lot that because we got engaged before I went to Vietnam, which I mm -hmm. thought was pretty stupid um, because she was the kind of woman that I think she would have stayed devoted to me if I was killed. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that would have been fair to her. But it didn't work out that way. Mm -hmm. um, but. You know, I think she saw a different person in me from, from when I left. Okay. Uh, now, aside from just the business about not wanting to sleep in a bed for a while, did you have other kind of readjustments you had to make once you got back? Yeah. I, 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 in your service, you're very regimented. And, like, one night I went for, um, I wanted to go get some cold cuts one night, and I remember this, and I went to a deli. And it was the deli closed at nine at ten o'clock or something, and I was there like nine thirty, quarter to ten, and I wanted to order some cold cuts. And um, they wouldn't they wouldn't cut the cold cuts for me because they said it's too close to closing. I don't want to clean the machine again. And I kind of sort of went off on them, and probably said some words I shouldn't have said because you're open until ten o'clock. Why can't I get my cold cuts until ten o'clock? Um, I've had bursts like that. Mm -hmm. So, because again, I, I just felt that I was regimented. I mean, if you're open until ten, you're open until ten. So you the know? world should work like the army. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I had I had adjustments to make, mm -hmm. and I had to adjust myself back to what was the norm here. Mm -hmm. Did you have to change your language? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I did. I had to watch what I said. Okay. Um, all right. And who I said it to. Oh. All right. Now, did you ever um, get diagnosed with PTSD or anything like that? Or have you sought counseling? Or have you? Yes. PTSD, yes. Um, I, right now, I receive counseling uh, every two to three weeks with a, my doctor, Dr. Morgan, mm -hmm. um, who's been a tremendous help. Um, and, uh, no, he's helped me out quite a bit. Okay. Now I want to back up uh, to some other things about being in the service and, and, and being in Vietnam. 
Now, uh, you spent most of your time that year in Vietnam uh, in the field. Yes. You're on fire bases. Uh, you're not spending a lot of time even at, at a place like Fubai or Camp Evans. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, in those situations out in the field, um, what were race relations like? You had black soldiers, white soldiers. I did have an incident one night on guard duty with a, another soldier who was black. And um, somehow, somewhere, he got a hold of some marijuana. Mm -hmm. And I got a little upset because I could smell it. Um, and I said to him, I said, I know you're, you're a little high. I says, but you're not going to be any good to me. I says, if the enemy comes through the perimeter, I says, you're not, you're not going to be any good to me. I says, so I'm going to probably, you know, you're going to be probably first, and they're going to be second. So, and then ever since then, we really, it was a tough relationship. Mm -hmm. But I had to do it because, again, I was in charge. But in a way, that particular issue could have been with anybody. Yeah. But and it happened in that, yeah. that case. But, um, but otherwise, basically, did people just get along with each other because they were yeah. on the same oh, team? Yeah. We, all, yeah. we, we, all, we all formed a, bo uh, uh, a bond because mm -hmm. we all had a common mission. Yeah. Okay. Now, <coughs> when you were back on a big base like Evans or uh, at Fubai or someplace like that, um, did, did the races sort of segregate themselves or did you still no. stay with the same group? No, we all basically we all were in it for the same thing. It's just that the guard duty to me mm -hmm. was extremely important. Yeah. Okay. And aside from that one particular incident with marijuana, did you know this much by way of drug use or anything like that? No. Okay. No. Uh, and also, um, did you have in, encounter uh, many Vietnamese, either civilian or military? The Vietnamese, well, obviously, other than the enemy, um, mm -hmm. but back at the base camps, you saw them. Mm -hmm. Um, and I treated them with respect. I didn't, I didn't do anything. Um, I just didn't. I just treated them with respect. Mm -hmm. At that point, to me, they weren't the enemy. Yeah. And what kind of jobs do they do, as far as you could tell? It seemed like they did. Well, I was only back there like one time. Mm -hmm. It seemed like they did like like cleaning, if I could say that, yeah. like with the hooches and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but again, it was it's so. I think it was one day that I was there. Yeah, and you weren't really in places where there were villages or because up in the hills you don't have civilians. No, no, no. Yeah. No, you didn't. You didn't have much. Um, no, because you were you were constantly on a base. Okay. Uh, and then when you come back, um, you know, did you once you were back, did you follow the news of the war itself or pay attention to the anti-war movement or did you just tune those things out? I did follow it, um, and I understood more about it, mm -hmm. um, and I also I wanted to know what was going on because of the guys that I left there. Mm -hmm. And then as time went on, you know, it was really coming to an end. It was winding down. Mm -hmm. And when you came back, did you get involved with veterans organizations, or did you stay out of those? Yes, I did. I went to um, I joined a local VFW. Mm -hmm. I joined a local American Legion. Um, uh, what else? And that's really that's the only two okay. organizations that I joined. And All then right. later on, I excuse me, I joined the Purple Heart. Right. Okay. Now, where you were, were the VFW and the Legion receptive to Vietnam veterans, or did they treat you different? No, I think there was a lot of respect, a lot, and they they had a lot of respect for them. Mm -hmm. And were a fair number of Vietnam veterans joining those at that time, or were you kind of unusual? Um, with the VFW, there were quite a few um, Vietnam veterans. Mm -hmm. The American Legion, not so much. Okay. More with the VFW. Yeah. All right. Because in some areas, the VFW didn't always treat the Vietnam guys well. Uh, and it just depended, I think, where you were. Yeah, I, I've heard that. Um, but we even had our um, wedding reception at the VFW, mm -hmm. you know, when we got married. Okay. All right. Uh, now... I guess to think back to the time that you spent in the military and in Vietnam, are there other particular impressions or memories or things that stand out in your mind that you haven't brought into the story yet? Not right now that I could think of. I mean, it, you know, so much of my mind and, and attention right now is focused on 
you know, what I experienced at Firebase Strip Court, mm -hmm. you know, with the reunion. Right. Um, and I had the opportunity to meet somebody just a little while ago. Um, okay. Uh, and then at what point did you connect with the Ripcord Association? With a friend of mine who lives in Bridgewater, who doesn't live too far from me, mm -hmm. about 10 miles. Um, I knew him quite a few years ago at where he worked and never really knew, I guess, about Firebase Ripcord, um, the reunion. Mm -hmm. Uh, until I started talking to him again more recently and and then he's the one that said why don't you come down you can meet some friend of yours or you know mm -hmm. some other guys that you were with and I'm happy I did okay so yeah. this is your first time down here yes it is okay yeah uh, all right now I guess finally I guess to, to look back at the time that you spent in the service um, how do you think that affected you or what did you learn from it I've learned discipline um, I mean, I love the country, and I would do anything to defend the country. Um, I get a little upset with, you know, when I see some things that go on in the country. Um, I think it would be a good idea that it would be mandatory that they kind of sort of enact, I don't want to say the draft again, that it's mandatory that somebody serves some type mm -hmm. of time yeah. in the service, any branch mm -hmm. of service, mm -hmm. maybe for two years, and I think it would give everybody a good baseline of discipline. Um, a lot of a lot of people out there today, a lot of young people out there today. I'm not, I'm not jealous of it, but I think you know they have the world in front of them, mm -hmm. and it's okay. But I think there's that other line of discipline, which I know I definitely have, which is given me. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, the whole thing makes for a pretty good story. So thank you very much for taking the time You're to welcome. share it. Thank you. They're probably not going to like that comment. <laughs>